Last week we determined, we agreed, we came to a consensus that we are no longer awaiting God's judgment on our country like we've been hearing. If you're of any age at all, I'm still a really young guy. But, you know, I've heard it for a long time that God's judgment is coming. God's judgment, well, it's here. We established that. No one, there's no, is anybody debate that issue? I don't think anybody is willing to debate the issue of are we under God's judgment as a country now today? I think that we all would agree that's true. So if we're currently under God's judgment, the question becomes, what does he expect of us that he might, that he might, that he might remove that judgment. So last week we seeded the ground with some verses. I'm just gonna read through them very quickly because I don't wanna get hung up here, I wanna to get to the next point, but I think it's important that we review. First Chronicles 7:14. if my people, remember that, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. This is talking about a national society wide, which is what we're, this is this, where we are. That's what this is talking about. Jeremiah 19, 15, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring upon this city and upon all her towns all the evil that I have pronounced against it because they have hardened their necks that they might not hear my words. It's an important phrase, you need to remember that. That, because they won't hear my words. Jeremiah 26, Three, if so be they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. Repentance. Revelation 3.19, this is the Lord talking to us. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and say it. Repent. Got a lot of work ahead of me. Repent. Repent. We talked about the deceived prophet for the sake of gain tells those who seek God in sincerely a false prophecy of blessing and that the people who are falsely seeking God's will are destroyed and the prophet. Do we have any of that going on today? We talked about the fact that the men of God are, are indeed a key component to this whole thing of whether God will remove his judgment from a nation. The man of God is a key component. We talked about Nineveh. Nineveh we can use as kind of a template for when we see an entire society repent and God removes his judgment from that society. And here are the, the six points we had. First, they believed God. They believed what the prophet told them. They brought the message that the prophet told them to the king, to the leadership of that country. The king repented and set an example of leadership for the people. The people responded to that leadership. And as a nation, at the direction of that leadership, they together sought God. They turn, and they turned from their wicked ways. Businessmen quit cheating people. The, the government quit corrupting, be, acting as a corrupt government, quit cheating the people they were cheating. The whole society turned from the things they knew they were doing that they shouldn't be doing. Then God sees their contrite spirit, their humility, and he responds by forbearing the judgment that he was going to give them in 40 days. So that's the template. Believe, they brought you leadership, leadership repented, leader, people responded, uh, sought God as a nation, God forgives, it's a contrite spirit. And so all week, my mind was focused on point number two, or actually point number three, the king repented and set an example. The king repented and set an example. We read Isaiah 57, 15, For thus saith the high and the lofty one that inhabiteth in eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. That's what he's looking for. Those are the kind of people that can be in his presence. We read Psalm 64. And like I said, I kept thinking, how, what are the practical steps that we take today to interact with the leadership that's here with us this week? You know, this week? If you read Exodus 32, you know, the, the calf, the golden calf, 
mentioned it off. Well, golden calf, the, Moses goes up to the mountain, gets the Ten Commandments. The people say, Moses has been gone a long time. I doubt he's coming back. Build me in. Let's build us an idol, Aaron. And Aaron says, you know, I don't really think that's a good idea. I'll tell you what. Give me all your gold. He was thinking that when he said to them, give me all your gold, that they said, well, no, I'm not going to depart with my gold. But they did. So now what's he going to do? Don't ever comment that. One of the, the lessons you can learn from that, we're not, gonna, we're not actually going to spend a lot of time here, but one of the lessons, there's a couple of lessons. One of them is, as a leader, you don't accommodate this sin. Because you think you're going to do something that's going to assuage their desire to do wrong by giving them a little bit, and then you end up, well, now I've just committed myself as leadership. Now I've got to go forward with them. That's one lesson. The other lesson is that whenever, whenever Moses went to hold them accountable for their sin, and that's one of the precepts, that's one of the things that has to happen, is the leaders have to hold the people who are responsible for the idolatry, the sin, the whatever it is that's causing God's judgment. They have to hold accountable those people who have perpetrated these crimes. Judgment must, justice must be done on an earthly level. That's one of the lessons. And, and the other thing was when it, you looked at it, see, there was about 40,000 men, roughly, for each tribe, except the tribe of Levite, who at that time who had about 30,000 men. They were a smaller tribe. That works out to about 500,000 men, not including women and children. Those who fell by the sword of the judgment of Moses at God's command were 3,000. That works out to less than 1%. Because of less than 1% of the people who were noisy, who demanded and threatened Aaron, that's how come this whole thing happened. There's a lesson for us here. Keep that in the back of your mind. So in going forward and how there's a difference in now between an understanding godly authority and how it worked itself out in a practical manner in the Old Testament and how that works itself now, out now in the New Testament age of grace. We're not picking up our swords and going slaying 3,000 people. That we don't have God's authority for that. And so I was going through this. That's what brought me back to Pastor's message about the right of revolution. And that's what brought me to the point that you know what? It's the body politic that has to be driving this train. And that's when I realized the body politic in this country is not driving that train. And that's when I realized we can't talk about point three till we've talked about point one. We're at the stage where, as a society, we are not believing God. We're not even believing God exists. We're not even believing that God has the power and the ability to hold us accountable for our sins. As a society, we're not believing. We, are you kidding me? So that's when it just, it dawned on me. This is not the message that needs to be preached. It's we the people. The first step of this whole thing. Where we have to focus our attention. So that's what we're going to do. So what I'm going to do, well, and, and so we read one of the verses last week about this. I talked about that chilling verse. Remember that chilling verse I talked about? Jeremiah 18, 11. Now, therefore, go to speak to the men of Judah. He's talking to God, God. Jehovah is talking to Jeremiah. Speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and, and devise a device against you. Return ye now, every one, from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. Now, Nineveh, when they heard that, they believed that, they went to the leadership, and you have the rest of the story. But in Jeremiah 18, when the people of Judah heard this, this was their response. Here we go. And they said, there is no hope. And that hope there is not referring to hope in God. What they were saying was, Jeremiah, there's no hope that we're going to listen to anything you say. Just go ahead and preach away. Just, 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 you're wasting your time. There's no hope. That, are you joking? We're not going to listen to you, Jeremiah. There's no hope. But we will walk after our own devices. And we will, everyone, do the imagination of his evil heart. There was condemnation, there was condescension, there was arrogance, there was, I do not believe you, Jeremy. There, there's a God, no. We can do anything we want, we'll be fine. Leave us alone, Jeremiah. That was what the children of Judah said in response to this rebuke. That's where we are in America. 
That is a picture of the United States right now. It's a picture of the broader Western civilization, but I don't care about that. I care about the United States. That's where we are. And there's a lot of, you can go, you can do a lot of study about how this, how we've gotten here, where this has come from, how it's developed, and there's variations, not a straight line that's, you know, decent into. See, that's why I want that lapel mic, but we're going to get to get fixed one day. See, I wouldn't worry about that. We're not in a, we're not, it's not a straight line descent. There's a, it goes something like that. Sarah and I, we enjoy watching Ozzy and Harriet when we go to bed at night. How many of you even know what that is? Ozzy and Harriet. Everyone that's raised your hand are over 50 years old, right? <laughs> if you're under 30, do you know what Ozzy and Harriet is? Not a hand. Okay, that's what I figured. How many of you have heard of Ricky Nelson? You people that are under 20. Maybe. Okay. I, was, I didn't know. I've, I've heard. My first introduction, this has to do with the judgment of God. Trust me, we'll get there. My first introduction to Ricky Nelson was um, the movie... Um, Oh, I hate it when I forget what I wanted. Parent Trap, thank you. Parent Trap. Ricky Nelson! You kidding? You know, that the whole, never mind. <laughs> That's the extent of my knowledge of Ricky Nelson. So we're, we, Sarah and I, we found Ricky, Ozzy and I, I wonder what, what this is. And I just watched this, you know, and there's this, there, you know, there's Ozzy Nelson, and then there's Harriet Nelson, and then there's David Nelson, and then there's Ricky Nelson. And I was like, wow, all these people, they're in a family. Isn't that cool? They're all a family. Wait a minute, Ricky Nelson. I think I've heard that parent. Oh, Ricky Nelson. This is Ricky Nelson. Nine years old Ricky Nelson. I didn't know this. I didn't know anything about Ozzy and Harriet. So we're just watching as and we've watched it for some time now. Well, just this week. And we like, one of the reasons we like is because of the commercials. Who's ever heard of liking a show because of the commercials? Well, they had the original commercials from back in the 1950s. And, I did, and so it started in late, like, 48 or 49, 52, and it goes all the way up through 1960-something, by which time we're not interested in it anymore, quite honestly. But... It shows the old commercials. And I think we're in season, do you remember what season we're in now, Sarah? We're in season nine. Thank you, hon. I knew I could rely on you for that. We're in season nine, so that's going to be roughly around 57, 1957-ish, somewhere in that time frame. And so one of the commercials was actually more like a public safety and a public service announcement, except it wasn't, it wasn't presented in that way. It was, it was the picture. You know those old 1950 pictures? You know, the, the, all the men had the real tight haircuts, and, you know, it just looks very traditional and very refreshing. <laughs> and, yeah, you know what I mean now, right? <laughs> and, and, and so here's the public service announcement. It was just, just a picture in the, old, in the 1950s kind of style of a, of a, a family with two kids, uh, with a son and a, a daughter. And, and, and the message was, was that uh, going to church is the backbone of our country and the strength of our country and go and find a church if you're choosing and be sure to attend church. That was it. 15 seconds. It was non it, was, it, it wasn't promoting a type of denomination or any type of doctrine or anything. It was just simply that message that the church is the backbone of our country and the strength of our country. You know, go and make sure that you find a church if you're choosing. That, you know, that, that, that whole thing couldn't happen now. Couldn't happen now. And I'm not one to get hung up, and I sure wish it was the old days, okay? I'm not that guy. But what in preparing for this message it illustrated something about our body politic. And now we're celebrating all manner of things. I wonder what God thinks of that. And they said, there's no hope, but we will walk after our own devices. We will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. We have forgotten God. We have forgotten God. You say, how can I forgotten God? I go to church regularly. No, no, no. I mean Monday morning. I mean Thursday evening. I mean Saturday, Friday night. Wednesday at lunch. Is God there? We have forgotten God. Thus, God's word has much to say. And I, I, I was looking, in all honesty, I've been, this whole subject matter has been on my heart for the last several months of what does God expect of a people. And, and I, of course, I know these stories. You know these stories. We've heard these stories. I've heard the word repent before. This is nothing new. I thought when I go into scripture, I'm going to research this. I'm going to find, I'm going to find some brilliant and deep answer. And I didn't, but I did. 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I didn't, but I did. Because the truth is, you know, it is as simple as what the template at Nineveh was. And we are at step one. We are down here where, you know, apathy, judgment, uh, repentance, blessing, apathy, judgment, repentance, blessing. We're in that cycle. We're down at the bottom of the cycle here. 2 Timothy 4, 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That's where we are. Yep. And you know, if, and I got, again began searching the scriptures about this, this premise, that it is us that has forgotten God. And I mean in the practical, real day-to-day, everyday, nitty-gritty way that we have forgotten God. That he's there and that we're accountable to him, and that he's watching, and we will, we will suffer consequences when we don't obey him, when we don't obey his law. God, look, God is not some killjoy up in heaven that can't wait. I can't wait to blast these people. And that's not God. God. God does not desire any of this, but God has set up his law and natural law and God's law and revealed law, there is a law that he has established and he cannot in his nature allow for an abridgment of his law forever. There has to be, he is a God of mercy, he's a God of justice. He's both, he has to be, or there is no mercy if there's no justice and there's no justice, there's no mercy, they they coexist. You can't have one without the other. And so God is not up there just waiting to pounce on you But he is mandated by his own character and his own nature to uphold his law. And he cannot forever allow an abridgment of his law. And there will not forever be an abridgment of his law. For he is God. Remember those three people I was talking about to you, fairly well known in the alt media, and they said this one profound thing. I know there's a God, and I ain't him. Okay, Whether you like it or not, accept it or not, wish it were different or not, irrelevant there is a god you will be accountable to him he will have the last word that's right Amen. okay and as my dad often told me you can do this the easy way or you can do it the hard way we've all heard that well but god is not like our earthly fathers who do this out of their tempers and out of their and with their defenses not to say i'm not saying my dad was like oh he was, oh, but one time, one time, 16 years old, I, I said something I shouldn't have said. I admit I said something I shouldn't have said. And within the next, the next realization was I'm sliding down the, down the wood hallway. <laughs> Ain't doing that again. I'm not proponent of that. Well, maybe when he's 16. But if we're getting to that point, we've already, I better stop while I'm behind. (laughs) And Moses said unto the people, fear not, fear not, for God is come to prove you, to test you, to improve you, to make you better. He's come to prove you and that his fear may be before your faces. That's an important phrase, that his fear, not his terror, his reverence. Respect for who he is, for what he is, and what his mandates are, not only on us, but himself. That his fear may be your fa- before your faces, that ye sin not. Look, this is all prevented. I don't, want, I don't want to do this. I don't want to judge. I don't want. We want peace. I want to bless. I mean, how many of you, don't raise your head, but your hands, but you have kids, and I just know that you're the kind of parent that's looking around the house, I can't wait to get onto that kid, right? I mean, you're no, no parent does this. Now, we all have mistakes, and I'm not saying we're perfect parents, but no parent and a, a no naturally normal good parent is going to be sitting around, I just can't wait to beat the tar out of that kid. God is not that way either. He's better than us in that respect, actually. He loves us, and he wants to bless, Okay? So I'm going to read a lot of verses here that drive this point home that there is this relationship between why does God's judgment happening is because of our fear getting God. Even, and again, look at the premise. We're not talking about the heathen here. We're, not talk, we're talking about his people forgetting God. Is that possible? 
Obviously it's possible. Look where we are today. We've established that premise. So yes, it's possible. It's happened. Psalm 36, one. Okay, so I'm going to do quite a bit of reading. If you want to turn, well, I'm going to do it fast. I, I like reading scripture fast because I like to get the context and the feel for it, okay? We're not doing an exegesis of these verses. I want to get an overall picture and feel. So follow along with me. Psalm 36, one. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart. I'm not going to get hung up on the verbiage there, but the transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes, before the wicked man. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes, until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. Five times in the book of Judges. Now, in the book of Judges, we know that whole cycle just happens again and again and again and again and again. Well, it actually happens five times. It's actually six, but it seems like again and again. But six, at least a half dozen times throughout the book of Judges, this cycle happens. So let's read some of the verses. Jud, uh, Judges chapter 3, verse 7. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam in the groves. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of... Now, I practice this word, this guy's name. Chushan Rish and Thame. You want to try it? We're going to call him CH, if you don't mind. And he sold them into the hand of CH, king of Mesopotamia, and the children of Israel served CH eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, Othan Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's older brother. Remember that guy, Caleb? The point is, the children did evil. The Lord was angry. The children of Israel cried unto God. That's where we are. That's where we need to get to. Amen. We're not there. We need to get there. The next story, in the, the next judge, same chapter, verse 12. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. You mean to tell me that the Lord would have another nation invade God's people in order to correct them? Can that really happen? Absolutely, it can happen. It had, did happen, and it's happened many more times than I'm going to reveal in Scripture, just the verses we're going to read. You mean today that could happen? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's right. Now, the New Testament explains the Old Testament, but the New Testament also says, the Apostle Paul, that we can learn about God's character and His nature through the Old Testament. Now, that was what I was struggling with. There are some, there are some particular differences in how things act in the Old Testament versus the New Testament. But his, print, his character, his nature does not change. Right. Okay? So we can glean from these Old Testament stories about the principles that are in play today in our society right now. When you see Thursday night, that's a judgment of God, people. I know that the mainstream of the world would say, that's ludicrous. No, it's not ludicrous. It's exactly what we see happening in so many of the stories that Scripture has for us and saying, hey, people, you're not exceptional. This is the same old playbook that's playing out again and again and again and again from the Garden of Eden when, God, when Satan said to Eve, hath God really said? And it's the same playbook, folks. Yeah. So the same solution is at play here. And the children of, Israel, children of Israel did evil because they had done evil. And, and, and he strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, because he had done evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. People died here. There was war and they lost war and people died because of their evil ways, because of God's judgment. This is serious. Folks. We're not playing around with just, you know, he's going to slap you on the wrist and you get to choose which crime you've served partial punishment for because you're in the upper class and we have a divided lawfare now. God doesn't play that way. When he decides to judge a nation and pluck down a nation, there will be blood in the streets. Are you understanding this, America? So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, for 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, when they finally came to their senses, 
when they finally had enough of their own pride, when they finally humbled themselves before their God, when they finally had said, we've had enough, we recognize we are the problem, we messed up, we will repent. Then, and only then, did God provide the judge who delivered them. He provided the leadership that then delivered the people from the judgment. Judge 4.1, Judges 4.1, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord when Ehu, the previous judge, was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Heresheth of the Gentiles. Why do I read all that? Because these are real people, real flesh and blood people, real historical events that happened then and will happen in the next few months, in the next few years, we don't know. But this is what we're liable for, folks. That's right. Chapter 4, verse 3, And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron. This is the other part of this. To the children of Israel in, cha in Judges chapter 4, verse 3, when they finally cried unto the Lord, the, God's word is saying this because they thought this is hopeless. We can't possibly beat these people. Have you heard that today? It's hopeless. We can't resist. Have you got F-16s? Has anyone said that recently? And he's not on our side. He's the one being used of Satan to keep us from having the courage. You get it? This is the same thing that's happening there. This is nothing new. This is the same human nature. I'm making this point for a very specific reason. Sometimes we get the idea that in the it can't happen. This is different. No, it's not. It's the same human history, the same human nature, the same God of the universe. The same nature, the same principles. They're exactly the same. What you read here is what will apply now. We can take what we glean from here and we can apply it to today and extrapolate into the future with certainty that if we do what God says, he will honor his word and he will do what he has done before. That's the point here. Amen. Amen. The children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. But then Deborah, the prophetess. God heard their cries. They finally came to the end of themselves. They finally got over their pride. They got over their exceptionalism. And they, they remembered God. Then God gave the leadership and he brought the deliverance. Two more. Judges, chapter 6. Midian. You can remember who the prophet of the prophet was that fought against Midian because his name rhymes with Midian. It's Gideon. You learn all kinds of things when you study for uh, sermons. It's, I've heard this story a million times. Never made that connection. And the Lord of and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Are you rolling your eyes yet? I mean, when are these people going to get it? Well, when are we going to get it? Amen. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And Israel, and I'm skipping down to verse 6, And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, finally. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, okay, the Lord is long-suffering and patient, but even he has his limits. <laughs> Listen to this. It came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord said, sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, the children of Israel, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Now listen here, children. I have brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all the previous that have oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. How many times are we going to go through this? And how many times has it happened in human history since then? Thank the Lord that he doesn't change. And that is, he is always the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. 
thank the Lord that these principles are still the same. And so therefore we have hope that in the midst of this current judgment we are in as a nation, that not all is lost if we can get to step one. Yeah. Yeah. Judges chapter 6. This is the prophet Jephthah. Judges 10, 6. And the children of the Israel, guess what it says? Can anybody get the, you getting the point here? Guess what it says? And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Asheroth and the gods of Seir and the gods of Zedon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines. Whew. I mean, you know, it sure would be easier to serve one God, you would think, wouldn't it? <laughs> and forsook the Lord and served not him. They forgot God. See that the, rep the repetition of this forgetting God, of neglecting God, of putting him, you know, I'm going to do my own thing. Is this now? Is, is there any connection to what we see now? That's the point. Yes, we're, we're right smack in the dabble. Right. The dabble. We're right smack dab in the middle of this condition. That's right. right here. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and the anger of the Lord is hot against the United States. I mean, you plug it in there. This, I mean, I said I like equations. Here's an equation. Okay? Have we established enough data to create a line that gives us a formula that we can plot against the, you know, and maybe there's a few outliers, but for the most part, you see the trend, right? Now we have an equation, we can put data in, and we know what the next problem is going to look like. This is, this is why I wanted to do this. There's, there, there's brilliance in the monotony. The, the, there's so much we can get into, but okay. Oh, man, I got loads of time. Judges 10.10, 10. and the children of Israel, guess what? Cried unto the Lord. Say it with me. They cried unto the Lord. Yes. They cried unto the Lord, saying, we have sinned against thee. Wow, these people, they went beyond crying. They said, look, we have sinned against you, God. Would to God that we would say that today. Amen. As a society. Amen. And the children of Israel cry, we said, we have sinned against, the, uh, the, against thee, both because we have forsaken our... They're getting it. This is the sixth iter iteration over about 250 years. They're finally getting it. Will we get it? We've sinned against thee because we have forsaken our God. Remember, we're not talking about them. The heathen. We're talking about us, God's people, forsaking God, of ignoring God, of not practically really grasping on to God is the picture here. We have forsaken our God and also serve Balaam. One of pastor's messages several years ago was who Moab, who, not Moab, who Molech was. Any of y'all, can you remember the sermon about Molech and who Molech really was? This is going back several years. You could put in the state for him. Worshippers of the state. That's a very general term. You'd be wrong to go in and get into a whole lot of particulars with that. But the general principle is there that those that serve the state and make the state their god. Okay. They were into this as well. These are Christians in the Old Testament sense who are also statist. We see any of that today? Are you making these connections? And they served Balaam. They, they, they forsook their God and then also served Balaam. Judge 10, 11. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and the Amorites and the children of Ammon and the, from the Philistines? The Zidonians also and the Amalekites and the, Ma the Maonites did oppress you. You cried unto me and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods. Wherefore, I will deliver you no more. Has he said that to us? Then he said, go and, cry unto, go and cry unto the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you from the tribulation. One of the, saddest, one of the saddest passages in Scripture to see God actually say, I've had enough of you people. 
Go deliver yourself. Go to your other gods. This is the God of the universe, the forbearing, long-suffering, merciful, loving God that gave his own son on the cross, died, was, took our sins upon him, buried, rose from the dead so that we can have a home in heaven. That God that loves us that much to do that is getting to a point of frustration, and even he has limits, and he says to these folks, you know, I've had enough of this. Go cry unto your gods. Let them deliver you. I've had enough of you. But look what happens next. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, we have sinned. We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Wow, that's repentance. When you have someone that is so repentant that they said, look, I've, I've, I have no leg to stand on here. Do whatever you seem. Do whatever seems good to you unto me. I deserve it. That's a contrite spirit. They said, do thou unto us whatever seemeth good unto thee. But then the next point is very important. They said, deliver us only, we pray thee this day. They still clung to whom they knew was God. And they put away, and they put away the strange gods from among them. They didn't just say these. They physically went and did it. And served the Lord. And his soul, the Lord's soul, was grieved for the misery of Israel. And then he gives them the deliverer. But have I made clear the pattern? When the people cried, when they got to the end of themselves, when they said, you know what, we're convinced now. We need God. We are not. There is a God. I'm not him. And we're not there as a society. That's the problem. Look, we may have, look, the Democrats may have a political crisis on their hands. The Republican Party may soon have a political crisis on their hands. So what? Both of those parties could go away. We could still be fine. There's a constitutional crisis on our hands. Yes. And you know, like we said, if the, if the roles were flipped and the parties were different, and that would have already been done. As important as that is, that's not what's priority here. This is the priority. The spiritual crisis we are in, in a, as a country. That is the problem we must solve. That's what our pastor is trying to bring to our attention through all of his messages. And the men of God are a key component of that. But ultimately, folks, it's not the men of God. The, God gives us the men of God in relationship to what he sees from our hearts. And so when those men of God are being pulled away and you're finding less and less of that, what that is an illustration of is the judgment of God. That's how I know we're here, among other things. And that's why, what's the point here? Well, we're not even past point one of the Nineveh template. And point one is they believed God. They quit forsaking God. They quit in their life pretending that they had no accountability to God. They quit wagging their finger in the face of God and saying, we're going to do what we want to do. We don't believe we have any accountability to you, that we have to abide by your laws. That's a joke. I'm a man of science. You don't need to, that hocus pocus baloney malarkey. And look, that's part of what all the Zionism has created, a mystical kind of hocus pocus feeling to Christianity that people that can't and it doesn't make sense and that was that's one of that's one of many many factors look we could get into Zionism I wish I could how this all dovetails together I'll say this the things that I was talking about off camera about what's happening now that was very bone to happen before that's been happening for some 500 years. Have you figured out that there's a global imperialism? A global, I'll call it the global trade imperialism. That's been with us for a long time. And the parties involved in that have been contentious and been making continued attempts at corralling and containing other nations for the purpose of maintaining that global imperialistic system. The names are important. The concept's important. 
and that what we're suffering is the same old playbook. And America was here fighting that spirit before. Actually, at least a couple of times, if you look at the American Revolution and the War of 1812, and it's time for a third one. But I'll let you do some research on that on your own. So I'm not saying that when we recognize that this thing I'm talking about is the priority, it doesn't mean, therefore, we can ignore the other stuff that we need to be paying attention to as Christians and civically civic-minded, responsible citizens of this country. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that with, if we don't recognize this first priority of the spiritual crisis we're in and we get this right, all of our efforts in the other venues are going to be worthless. That's what I am saying, okay? So our, our responsibility and our problem today is that we are ignoring God. Yes, God's people are ignoring God in very practical and real ways in our own individual lives. That's where it has to start. And when that is corrected, then God will respond, and we can move then to the next step of the process, which is the leadership responding. So let me read some more verses to get through this. But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, he's talking about the idolaters, that furnish the drink offering to that number, those idolaters. And we need to, look, in the New Testament time, okay, our idols don't look like totem poles. I mean, they might. But no, because we have the Spirit of God, we, we now have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Our idols perhaps could be more conceptual, but they're every bit as real. An idol is anything, anything that you place on the throne of your heart besides Jesus Christ. Amen. That is an idol in our age of grace today. What have you put in place of Christ on the throne of your heart? Your children, your job, your house, your bank account, your retirement, your, your wardrobe, your car, your power, your position in life, the respect you think you get from people that, based on what perceptions you have of what you think people think of you. <laughs> Who cares what people think of me? I, it's what Christ thinks of me that's important. Okay? These are idols. These are every bit as disgusting and evil to God as any other kind of idol you can imagine. And it's incumbent upon us as God's people, to search our hearts to see if we have any such idols there in God's place on that throne where only he should be. And that's what he was talking about in Isaiah 61, 11, but ye have ye, But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain. You prepare a table for that trip. I mean, you go out of your way to make accommodations and, and to worship your idol, whatever it is. You go out of your way to furnish a drink offering for that group over there, or that many multitude of things, whether it's one thing or a multitude of things, but you forgot me. Jeremiah 3.21, a voice was heard under the high places weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. There's another example of a positive where they were. Deuteronomy 4, 23. Take heed to yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you and made you a great, which he made with you. And instead, make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God had forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Now look, again, I've said, I'll make this clear. God is not some ogre in the sky waiting to pounce on you. But he is obliged, he's obligated to uphold his law. Yeah. And he cannot forever allow the abridgment and the violation of his natural laws and his revealed law. So at some point, he has to execute justice and judgment is the way he does this. And it's at that point, how are we going to react? I got a little, a little tidbit. We, we tell the teenagers, you know, I've taught teenagers for so many years. And one of the things is keep a clean slate for you that are... 
a disciple of Christ. Uh, and I use, I don't, I don't like using the word Christian. There's, there's a lot of people call themselves Christian. I mean, are you a disciple of Christ? And we are, we are made of the same flesh. We're not going to be perfect. And so when God convicts you of sin, keep a clean slate. Get that thing in front of the Lord. Confess it. Repent. I don't care. You know, one of the things that, that get off on a tangent here. I used to get frustrated in my early Christian life because I kept, I kept having to ask God to forgive me for things. And it was frustrating. Uh, how come I keep having to ask God for And it finally dawned on me, you know what? That's every bit of works-based theology as if I say I got to do something to get saved. My standing in Christ is not by virtue of my lack of sin in my life. My standing before God is based on Christ's virtue Amen. and what he has done and, and his holiness in my stead. Amen. And when it finally dawned on me that this was true, it's not like I went and go partying or anything. I didn't, okay, it's not. But, but the anxiety and the, and the frustration and that I'm not ever good enough, I'm never good enough, I'm never good enough, I'm never good enough, you ain't supposed to be good enough, you ain't supposed to be good enough, Christ is good enough, Christ is good enough, okay, wow, incredible, so liberating, Amen. I'm not happy about it, and I would tell my kids on my basketball team when I coached high school basketball, I said, look, guys, I'm trying to teach you some principles here, when you fail, get up, keep going, God didn't quit on you, don't you dare quit on God, you're going to make mistakes, you are flat, I'm not, I'm not giving you an excuse to wallow in your sin you know, like, like the Apostle Paul said God forbid that his grace may abound that I go okay what I have license to sin now no of course not but I do realize that letting Satan beat you over the head with the bloody end of that sin all the time and keeping you down where you can never do anything for God that's just as sinful as the sin itself so get, accept the forgiveness that God gives for you today and go on and go on and keep getting up and keep fighting getting up getting going ah, anyway whole another thing Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord which you made with you, and make any graven image or the likeness of anything. For the Lord is a consuming fire and a jealous God. That's what my point was. He is a jealous God over truth and law and his law and his relationship because he loves us and he wants to be able to bless us. But it's not that he's a jealous God like he's some guy with a paintball machine gun ready to pounce on you. When thou shalt beget children and children's children, ye shall have remained long in the land. Listen, this is the problem here. This is where we are. You've remained land, long in the land. You've become the sole hegemon of the world and shall corrupt yourselves and make a graven image or, anything, or any likeness of anything and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God to provoke him to anger. That's the United States. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land. Stop. What did he just say? That ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereon you go. I mean, does that principle apply to us today in the United States? Yes, sir, it does. Right. It absolutely does. Yes. We're on the brink of that, whether you realize it or not. Yeah. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and you shall be left few in number among the heathen. And the Lord... And the Lord, and you should be utterly destroyed. For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he swear unto them, if you will repent. Remember, God is bound by these same laws that we are. And so if he says this is the formula, all we had to do is plug the variables into the form, plug the data in there, do what he says to do, and he promises that this will be the result. Now, we don't need to be presumptuous because we are not God. It's not like he's our to command. But I'm saying he has established a principle that is true, and if we do this today, if we get to step one, we can go to step two. But the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt with great power and a stretched out arm, him shall you fear. In him shall ye worship, and him shall ye do sacrifice in the New Testament sense. What's the sacrifice we give him now? Our very lives. Remember that, Romans 12, 1 and 2? Paraphrasing. Giving unto him our, our lives, that, which is our reasonable service. Okay, That's our sacrifice. Now, are you doing that? 
and the statutes and the ordinances and law and the commandment which he wrote to you, you shall observe to do forevermore, and you shall, feel, and you shall not fear other gods. In the covenant I made with you, you shall not forget, neither shall you fear other gods. Give respect, give credence, give worry about them, try to please them. That's what that's saying. But the Lord your God shall you fear, and he shall deliver you out of the hand of your enemies. America, listen to this. Our society, the United States, the people of the United States, listen to what God is saying to you here. We've, we, what was this, what, the 13th, the 13th illustration of this now? Psalm 78, 7, that you might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. I'm giving you all these examples of where this is repeated over and over and over in Scripture. This is the problem, okay? They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders, and he had showed them. That's Psalm 78. That's the genesis of the problem right here today. We, as God's people, have forgotten God. We don't give him the preeminent place in the throne of our heart that we should. And if we would do our job here, then he could remove the judgment. They soon, Psalm 106, they soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Psalm 119, 153, consider mine affliction, deliver me, for I do not forget thy law. This is the crucial linchpin of the whole process, folks, is that we have to, we have to assimilate and make God a reality and a priority in our lives as opposed to, even, on, even though we call ourselves nominally a Christian, and maybe even nominally a disciple, that we neglect him. But with fervency, we seek the Lord God with all of our heart. And we all fail at this. I'm not saying he's looking for perf a perfection in this, but this is the communication. This is, the, this is our life. This is, what's the New Testament word for that? Um, the communication of our life, which means the, the, the overall theme and and, and consistent, the consistency of our life. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Yes. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of him, knowledge of his law, knowledge of who he is, knowledge of our accountability to him. All these things we've neglected and forgotten as a society. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Because I have rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee, thou that say, or, or that thou shalt be no priest to me. There will be no prophecy. There'll be no word of God. There'll be no revelation of His word to that people. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. This is I can't I can't emphasize enough the importance of this and the glaring what has struck me like a ton of bricks. Sarah knew how hard this, she was seeing how hard this was. <laughs> this is us we're talking about. This is me we're talking about. Yeah. Jeremiah 23, 25. I'm almost done. I have heard what the prophet said, that prophesy lies in my name, saying I have dreamed a dream, I have dreamed a dream. The prophecy said, I have a dream, oh, this is whatever. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. This goes back to the deceiving prophet we talked about last week. But the key verse here, I want to look at Jeremiah 23, 27. These prophets which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor as their fathers have forgotten my name in Baal. You mean to tell me that there are out there, there are people who call themselves men of God who, because of the deceit of their own heart, are actually out to try to deceive the, their people that they need not worry about what God thinks about it. You're okay. Everything's fine. Is that happening today? Amen. Absolutely it is. Yep. Amazing how this Old Testament stuff has no application to us. No, we're seeing it. We're living it. Deuteronomy 8, 11, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God, and not, keep, and not keeping his commandments, his judgments, his statutes, which I command you this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full, and, and you are full, and when, there, when you're the world hegemon, and, and the U.S. dollar is the world banking system um, reserve currency of the world, and you can go out and demand everyone play your game your way. And when thy herds and your flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all thy hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up. And thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt in the house of bondage. Same thing. That's where we are today. 
Hosea 13, 6, according to their pasture, so were they filled, their coffers, their, their power, their wealth, and like, like a pasture filled with cattle and sheep. They were filled and their heart was exalted. Therefore, have they forgotten me? Yeah, the, one of the worst things God can do for a person or for any, any nation is give them prosperity and success. Therefore, I will be unto them as a lion, as a leopard by the way will I observe them. I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps. <laughs> we know what that's like around here in the mountains. And will rend the call of their heart, and there will I devour them like a lion. The wild, the wild beast shall tear them. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help, if you will cry unto me. I know, I can see in your faces, that this is becoming redundant. Good. Because that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to paint a picture that this has happened. This, is, this has got to be, what's the national debt? $35 this has to have been the 35 trillion iteration of this process in human history. That's what the point is. If we were a scientist and we were looking at this logically, when we have this many data points to establish a pattern, a, a, a formula, whatever you want to call it, you know, we can bet, you can go to the bank with this, that this is our situation today, and if we act according to the way God's Word says to act, He will deliver us from this current judgment. There's hope here, folks. There really is. If we will remember our God. If we will turn from our wicked ways, if we will seek God. Psalm 9, 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Therefore saith the Lord thy God, because thou hast forgotten me and cast me behind thy back, therefore bear thou also thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. I told you earlier, we watch Ozzy and, Ozzy and Harriet, you know, and it's relaxing. You, know, you can watch this in, well, up until the, when they get into the 60s. But before then, you can watch it and it's just relaxing and you know you're not going to, it's almost like whenever that, uh, who was that French ambassador that came to the United States and talked about the fact that you could go there and you could go across all the colonies and never have your conscience violated once. And you might even see a commercial of a public service announcement that says, go to a church if you're choosing because the church is the backbone of our society. Amen. And where have we come since that was 1957 or 8? So do you doubt what I'm saying about the fact that we were under God's judgment? No, sir. And whenever we, were when we, when we neglect God, we see the things we're seeing, thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. Are there any lewdness and whoredoms going on in the United States today? First president of the United States, like I said last, white, last, last week, issues a single day to proclaim thanksgiving to God. And now we issue a proclamation for an entire month to celebrate an abomination before God. I don't care what you call it. I didn't make this up. That's God's word. If we're in the business of trying to make ourselves comply with God's word, we might as well recognize the truth. I am not saying, and I better, I better say this, and that's why I was so careful that I didn't bring the message that I thought I was going to bring here because if it would be a wrong. It would be, a, it would be a, a sin against God not to clarify that any sin is an offense to God. Your heterosexual fornication and adultery is as much sinful and loathsome and evil in the sight of God than any other kind of lewdness or whoredoms that you can that you can say okay so we're, this is not about singling out any group of people and trying to say you're evil this is singling out all of us and saying this is holy and this is what we must comply to okay i don't care what you look i'm i'm so, I'm so sick and tired of having to make excuses for this this whole woke agenda but this is not something we're making up. Right. right and wrong is not defined by your preferences, nor mine. Nor mine. 
I have no right to mistreat any person of any persuasion for any sin they may commit. As an ambassador of Christ, I have a duty and an obligation, first understanding my own sin, Amen. to lovingly and in an encouraging way show them the love of Christ and his forgiveness that I needed and need today, just like they need and will need. Amen. So there's, no, there's none of this justification for mistreating anybody for any reason that's what the love of god is all about and that's why if you look watch, and also if you watch that message that pastor preached about the right of revolution he, the first half of the first half of the whole sermon was about setting some premises and principles that as christ's disciples everything we do we must do in love if we are reflecting the love of god then everything we must do must be in the spirit of the love of the people that we are trying to minister to. So it's, I am violating God's laws if I, in a spirit of anything less than love, attack or denigrate or mistreat or intimidate or you put the word in there, someone because of, I, because of their sin, it just makes me as bad as any sin they may have ever committed. So my, my, my railing against a government that now has the audacity before God to use their God-given authority to force or propagate something to the whole society that whether they realize it or not, whether they accept it or not, is a violation of God's laws and an, and an abomination to him. I'm sorry, that I don't owe you, government, any fidelity to accommodate your mistreatment and your misuse of your authority within the jurisdiction you have. I don't. I must obey God rather than man, but when I do so, I must do so in compliance to the spirit of Christ that he requires of me as an ambassador of Christ. Yes. Okay. Proverbs 1.20. I had this memorized when my kids were first being born. Before Emily was born, I said, you know what, I'm going to memorize the book of Proverbs so that when my kids come to me, they can ask me any question and I can have the wisdom they need. <laughs> I got through chapter 1. I got halfway into chapter 2. I don't know, I got busy paying bills or something happened, now and, and now they're all grown. But I had this portion memorized. I'm not going to try to do that here. What we're talking about, I'm going to wrap this up. What we're talking about, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. You see how this verse makes sense in everything we've been talking about? Proverbs 1, 20. Wisdom crieth out she uttereth her voice in the streets the wisdom of god is not trying to hide him hide itself from you he's not he wants to be found of you he's making every effort he can to dis to reveal himself to you yes. he loves you and he wants you to spend eternity with him yes. he doesn't want you to have to suffer the judgments of hell because of the abridgment of his justice and his law that he cannot renege for any reason. He can't go back on it. Wisdom crieth out. She crieth in the chief place of concourse where business is done, where you can't miss it. In the openings of the gates, in the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity and the scorners delight and they're scorning. Have you heard any of this going on today? And fools hate knowledge. Read, read Romans chapter 1 and 2 to find out what God thinks about our human wisdom and what, where you end up. You end up where we are today. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you because I have called and you've refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all of my counsel, and would none, or would have none, of my reproof. There's going to come a time that God will say, 
I will also laugh at your calamity. There, there does come a time when there's no going back. The New Testament talks about the sin and the death, and we really don't know what that is. It's probably different for different individuals. Only that individual and God knows it. There is a limit. And at that point, I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call on upon me, but I will not answer. And, and I have to acknowledge the, the New Testament principles of election and all of that. And this, this is a proverb. This is a general admonishment of his principles. So I, I'd be wrong not to acknowledge that. Okay. If I had more time, we'd get into that. Once you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you are always saved. Amen. Okay, it's very important to make this point here. Now, you will always be liable to his chastisement and judgment the longer you dis disobey. And I mean, but losing our salvation is not on the table here. And in this, in, in this discourse in Proverbs chapter 1, 20, we're talking in a principled kind of manner. You shall call upon me, and I will not answer. They will seek me early, and they shall not find me. For they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. There have been people like this. They get to the end of that point, and it's just it's too late. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them. And the prosperity of fools, the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. When I was 23, Emily was born when I was 24. So, yeah, you don't mind me talking about you like this, Emily, do you? No. It's, it's one thing you can bear to your family. Anyways, when I was 23, this meant a lot to me because I'm a young man, I'm having a family, and there's all this ahead of me. And Whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. And again, that's not some axiom you can take. There's going to be distress and stuff. But the point is, generally speaking, if you will give yourself to the Lord, if you will follow his ways, he will protect you and he will provide for you and he will protect your family. And I tell you, that spoke volumes to me at that young age. So... What, okay, so let's bring this together. Let's, let's close this up. What can we do? What are some practical applications of this? Judge ourselves that we be not judged. First, First Corinthians 11.31, for if we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. That's where it starts. Remember, remember um, the verse we started off with. Second, Second Corinthians. If my people, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves. So we're talking about us. We're talking about us disciples of Christ. If we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. Are we seeking God for ourselves and for our society? Are we forgetting God? Is there any area of our life, is there any, any area of our life that's off limits to God? Are we completely sold out? Are we completely his lock, stock, and barrel every part of our lives? We're going to have problems. We're of the flesh. We're going to sin. We're going to fail. But as those things happen and the Holy Spirit convicts me of it, am I quick to repent? Am I quick to, get my, to wipe my slate clean and start again afresh and anew with the mercies of God? Am, am I as a disciple of Christ doing this? Are we exercising our spiritual disciplines? Are we praying consistently? Are we remembering our accountability to God and to His laws? One of the things when you prepare these messages, they're as convicting to yourself as it is, the, you know, so realize I'm talking to me as much as I'm saying it to anyone else. Reading God's word, yea, studying it, memorizing God's word enough. Are we being ambassadors for Christ? Are we showing his love to those around, or, around us? Are we encouraging others to look to the Lord? Are we letting our good works shine before men? Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Are you praying for your pastor to have boldness and liberty to preach? Thank God that we have a pastor. And, and I can say this because I've seen it firsthand for a very long time. I know this about the man 
who preaches behind this pulpit day, week in and week out. You know, it's, it, my, just remind you, it's one thing for me just to get up and preach a message here and there. Okay? It's a whole other ball game. For a man to get up and consistently preach the word of God week in and week out to his flock for 49 years. Whole nother level. Okay? Remember that. But are you praying for your pastor to have that boldness and have that liberty to preach? Second, Th- Second Thessalonians 3, 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. And that, they, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for, not all, men ha, for all men have not faith. If we're, not, if we're seeing a proliferation of crime families running around in Washington, D.C., perhaps we're not doing something we should be doing as God's children. Because there are unreasonable and wicked men. There will always be unreasonable and wicked men it's just the nature of human nature to get to the point that you thought that can't happen today no it can it will it's our duty to consistently resist evil if we're not resisting evil and it becomes that's what's happened among other things in the last 60 years we've allowed evil to proliferate because good men have done nothing have you heard that before but don't Remember, it starts with me. It starts with seeking God myself. Am I forgetting God? Pastor mentions this all the time. Are you in a church where the pastor is not addressing the salient issues of the day from God's word? Then why are you there? Seriously, look at where we are. Look at the judgment of God on our nation. It's time to quit playing games now, folks. I mean, it's been past time to quit playing games, but the longer we continue to play games, the worse this is going to get. Right. Remember all the stories. When they finally got to the end of themselves and they finally cry out to the Lord, when are we going to get there? If you can't find that pastor, or if you have a pastor that's not doing that, quit supporting that pastor, get to one that is. It's beyond time. Amen. Okay? And if you can't find one, then, you know, starting an LF satellite group, God bless you for that. I mean, that takes a great deal of courage and faith to do that. What are we doing? And, you know, it's nothing anymore to share pastor's messages. It's not like we have to print it out in ink and calligraphy on parchment paper, fold it up, lick it, put a stamp on it, and and literally just click. Sorry. Click. <laughs> Click. Wait a minute. Line copy. <laughs> Click. It's easy now. I mean, you don't even have to put your name in it anymore. Subscribe to his YouTube channel. I mean, these are things we can practically do to help get this out there. Amen. Pray for your authorities. <sighs> I got a. It's hard enough to pray. Pray for those authorities? Well, you know, yeah, pray for your authorities. Pray for those who are in levels of response, who are in positions of responsibility and authority to uphold justice and law. Amen. Yes, pray for that. You know, and if you have a leader that is corrupt, I don't think that necessarily means, Lord, bless him. No, Lord, remove him. I'm all for that. I mean, read all the Psalms. I mean, God's men didn't mince words about removing those who are evil. They didn't mince words about that. Yeah, pray for your authorities. If we have authorities in our various levels of jurisdictional, governmental, of God-ordained government that are not doing what they should be doing, there's nothing wrong with praying for their removal. Nothing at all. Pray for those that are in a position to hold those men accountable for their violations of the law and remove them. Amen. Okay, we don't have to support evil here, folks. That's right. And you know, so many times, like, pray for those. Re- <laughs> pray for their removal. Second Timothy two. I'm wrapping it. I exhort thee therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks may be made for all men. Go, go listen to that 
that message that pastor preached on the right for revolution. Go listen to it. You will be blown away at the saliency and its application to what we're talking about here. He really will. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. I, I marvel at how some at, at Christians not making the connection about how come it's important that they be engaged in the civil responsibilities that we have as citizens of this country. If we say that we're all about pray, uh, propagating the gospel to everyone that we can possibly do so, but yet we allow the authorities to, to, and for evil to propagate that inhibits our ability to do that, well, we're proving ourselves to be hypocrites. You know, it's, only, it's our own fault. So get with the program here. This is what Scripture is telling you to do. I mean, for King, pray for them and pray that the law be upheld and pray that God's law be upheld and pray for courage for those that are in positions of authority to uphold the law. Pray for protection from those that would try to bribe them and corrupt them. So is any of that happening? Pray for them so that we may live a peaceable and life with all godliness and honesty, so that we can serve the Lord Amen. with a free conscience and keep our free. That's what the whole founding fathers were trying to do for us. Amen. That's what it was about. So let's do that. God does not run quickly. And this was in part of pastor's message. 2 Corinthians 5, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We don't take a sword. We don't go out and just act as a mob. And we have to persuade men. We have to appeal to their conscience. We have to appeal to their heart through the love of Christ. If that's not happening, we're not doing it enough. It's past time for us to repent, to seek God, to turn from our wicked ways and be the salt and light we're supposed to be. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven I will forgive their sin, sin, and I will heal their land. And he has a whole program for doing that. But if we could just get to that first step, then we might see that other stuff happening. May God forgive us of our apathy and for forgetting him. And may he restore our land. Let's stand for prayer.